All right, Spread Aviation Nation, it's that time again. Episode 34 of the Spread Aviation Podcast. Hi, Rob. Hi. Hi, man. I was sitting here in the daze. No crap. There's probably going to be a weird, confused look on my face because I was sitting here going, did he say Plain Talk Podcast or did he say Spread Aviation? <laughs> oh, wait, which one did he say? No, spread Aviation. Okay, no, he yep. said it right. Because now Spread Aviation is the new norm. Yeah. So when I say Spread Aviation, you think I said Plain Talk Podcast because you're so used to it. I don't know what I it's thought a good I thing. said. It's a good thing. <laughs> so if we rename the podcast again, then Spread Aviation will be the thing that we keep going back to. Please, we're no. Not gonna re- no, we're not. We're, <laughs> we're Spread Aviation until... The Belmont. end of time. Belmont, go lay down. All right, so we got episode 34 here. There's a camera mounted on that. And don't, don't bite that. Rob is yelling at the cat for those <laughs> that are on the audio-only portion of this. Um, so let's get right into it, Rob. Uh, aviation news, anything you want to talk about? Aviation news. Yeah. Oh, well, I wasn't prepared for aviation news. You As- know, JetBlue has no flights out of Chicago after 11 a.m. on a Saturday. They leave their gate empty the entire day. Which is quite strange. Right. Um, Not a single flight. All their flights are in the morning, and they always talk about a gate shortage at O'Hare, yet that gate just sits there empty for the entire afternoon. I asked two people today. Well, maybe it's other people complaining about a, uh, gate shortages, not not JetBlue, because they already have their gates. But they could rent that gate out to somebody else. I, I worry that it's more complicated than that. Maybe. Because being but a, yet in a the carrier, mor- But yet in the morning, you come in and you sit in the penalty box because they only have one gate. So you have to sit there for half an hour until the gate becomes available. You mean JetBlue? Yeah, or other airlines. Or other airlines. Yeah. Well, see what what I worry about there uh, is is when you have a cert- certificated airline like that, uh-huh. um, everything gets examined by the FAA. It's part of your operating certificate, and so like your gate is part of that. Yeah, and so true. if you're another airline, you can't necessarily just rent someone else's gate without the FAA. Well, there are, there are, okay, well, I mean, there are numerous I mean, airlines. I so am for example, kind of making that up. It's, so, but, for example, JetBlue and Air Canada in Newark share a gate in Terminal A. Okay, then they've gone through that process. So it's a yeah. process that that is, is definitely something that people have gone through. Okay. Okay, so in aviation news, Boston to Nantucket, Cape Air's new P-212 Traveler. They're getting rid of the 402s. Really? Mm-hmm. Are they getting rid of the 402s in the Caribbean and elsewhere as well, or just... Uh... You know, I would bet that they would be because of the age of the airframe. Uh, and the the P-2... Oh, geez, the P-212. It's uh, this high-wing, multi-engine airplane, mm-hmm. so it's very, very similar, but uh, being the high wing, you get a little more stability with it, and being a new, uh, a newer airframe, uh, you're going to have um, uh, hopefully fewer mechanical issues mm-hmm. with the aircraft. Now, do you like high wing airplanes uh, for transport better than low wing? I mean, if I'm looking for a smooth ride, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm why, leaning towards high wing. Why is it a smoother ride? It's it's naturally stabilizing. Mm-hmm. So, uh, speaking of stability. So if I tried to hold the pen from here, I mean, that's very easy to do. And if I deflect it, it returns back to sure. its center, yep. okay? Whereas if I hold the pen from the bottom, mm-hmm. it's a much more difficult task Well, we learned stability. We learned about this. There are aircraft that are, are stable. Uh, there's three different types, right? It's neutral. Well, it's neutral, positive, and negative. Right. So does that, does that have anything to do with the actual location of the wings or can the... Certainly. Okay. Yeah, I mean, can you have does. Can you have um, negative stability high wing aircraft? Um, if you went, let's say, anhedral with the wings. So on the Cessnas Got and it. the Pipers, you you see dihedral, where the wings are are bent upwards. Mm-hmm. And if you went with anhedral, you would you would decrease stability with that. Got it. Um, but. You know, why would you do that unless you were actually trying to make something that was capable of, of maneuvering and changing its position, something that didn't want to be where it is? So so an aerobatic airplane, even with large control surfaces, large ailerons, uh, would would not really perform very well if it was a high-wing aircraft, even with the larger control surfaces. It would surfaces. perform less well. So the Decathlon is a high-wing aircraft. It's a high-wing aerobatic oh, yeah, aircraft. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, I mean, it's got plenty of of aileron authority but the roll rate on it is not really anything to write home about i think it's around 250 uh no 200 degrees a second somewhere in in that neighborhood and uh oh no it's less than that it's considerably less than that maybe it's 150 degrees a second so yeah it's 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 less than a full inversion in a second it's Mm -hmm. definitely less than that Mm -hmm. but um when you're talking about aerobatic airplanes 
unless you're talking about a training aircraft, you want higher performance. If you're talking about an aircraft that's meant to carry a whole bunch of passengers a long distance, you're generally going with a high wing. But um, they've gone away from that design because of the costs that go into uh, having to manufacture a high wing, heavy lift aircraft. So really not since the Dash 8s and the Dornier 328s uh, and the ATRs. Uh, I believe those were all high wing aircraft, but they all started out also as turboprop aircraft. The Dornier being the only one that I'm aware of that went to a, a, a jet, uh, a turbine version. And e even then it wasn't really any faster. Uh, the majority of airliners that are manufactured nowadays, they're low wing aircraft mm -hmm. and that's, that's by design. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, that's about as far as I can speak with any kind of yeah, fair enough. Any kind of authority on you, that. You can't pause and Google because you're on video this time. Oh, no, nah, I can totally I mean, pause can, and Google. But... <laughs> Just be a great spot for an ad read. Speaking of ad reads, <laughs> if you'd like to sponsor the Spread Aviation Podcast and have your logo right in, in this area, right here, right there, featured right there, send us an email, hello at spreadaviation.com, and we can fill in. Right. And for the 99% of the people that are listening to this podcast uh, on audio only, Rob was pointing to the center of the couch. It has an empty area for potentially displaying future ad, uh, it, advertisements. It can't even be a guest spot on the yeah. couch because we've got the yep. the microphones yep. mounted to the cup holder yep. tray. It does fold up, but oh well. I don't even know. What was I supposed to Google? I was going to Google. Uh, you were going to Google the roll rate of a decathlon. Oh, I could. But, but yeah, go ahead. Moving on. It, it, it's close enough. Uh, any other aviation news? Uh, let's see. <laughs> I was just on there. Uh, I I like so I I don't know that I really answered your question necessarily, but it it begs a whole nother question of why the two different designs, why are there low wing and why are there high wing aircraft, and uh, well one it comes down to design influence, uh, but on any given similar horsepower or engine or weight carrying uh, capacity, the Pipers are generally faster than the Cessnas because of that low wing and a little less drag because they don't have that strut that's hanging out there. Mm. You know, um, you don't have, now why do you need the strut in a high wing, but you don't need the strut in a low wing cantilever design. So in the Cessnas, they actually did produce at least two models of Cessna, the 210, not the original 210, but later models of the 210 and the Cessna 177 Cardinal were cantilever wing. And so it was, I believe a solid spar all the way through. It was one piece mm. and you didn't have any kind of joint uh -huh. there at the wing root that could flex that you needed to support with that wing strut. So whereas in the 172, it's not a solid, it's separate wings. It's separate wings, it's separate, wings. separate spars. Yeah. So that makes and sense. Okay. Yep. In, in, in the wing box. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. So then here's a mind blowing question for you. Mm -hmm. Is there any relation to high wing and low wing aircraft in the same way that there's a potential a comparison you could make to a prop on the front of the aircraft versus on the rear push Ooh. versus pull versus high wing line. like from a stability perspective i mean you were just giving me the pen example and one could well, yeah. almost say push versus pull can be kind of the same thing no i mean a low wing aircraft is less stable which is why you see them having more dihedral because as you uh, as you roll the aircraft or as uh, a rolling uh, motion is induced upon the aircraft from outside forces, mm -hmm. that that uh, descending wing will now have a deflection of its relative wind from mm -hmm. the bottom, which is an effective increase in angle of attack, and it'll be a dampening force. Mm -hmm. With the high wings, you have the weight of the fuselage getting off center at wanting to, to mm -hmm. return it, so you don't need as much dihedral. That makes sense. So then... So then it again begs the question of like, so there was that aircraft that you mentioned uh, that we saw at Sun and Fun last year, and it was the one with the propeller in the in the back. And you said like, there's only some of these flying and, and you know, when you, you lose a part, it's really hard to find another part. Oh, we were talking about the beach starship. Right. So, I'm, yeah. so, so from a stability perspective, you know, so what are those inherently more unstable because the, th the, 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 the prop is in the rear of the aircraft versus in the front? Well, with moving all your engine and your propeller and your components to the back like that, what so you I'm not even necessarily talking about a, a, like a center of gravity or anything. That's exactly yeah. where I was going with it. But 
<laughs> I, got, I, was I got that, but I'm more talking about just push versus pull in general, like comparison to high wing versus low wing. Are the, is there any similarities between those two or differentials? Or I mean, yeah, when, you know when what you I'm have um, a a tractor, which is what the Cessna 172s and the Paper Cherokees are tractor engine where the propeller is pulling the aircraft through the air. You also get the added benefit of prop wash over the wing, mm-hmm. helping to create a little bit more relative wind. Whereas with the pusher type aircraft, you're not going to get as much of that. Um, but it puts all of the noise behind the cabin. So you have a little bit more of a comfortable ride or a little quieter of a ride. Uh, the Piaggio, Avanti, the Beach Starship, uh, and even the Long Easies, uh, those are all pusher aircraft, and they're they're quiet in the cabin. But uh, I know the the long easies, depending on how they they did it. But most of those, the exhaust just goes straight through the propeller, and they're very very loud. But they also have a very unique sound. Um, the Beach Starship just has you know turbo prop sound, but mm-hmm. you know, I I think they're cool. Uh, but then you need you don't necessarily need, but I think all of those designs all have canards at the front as well to control your pitch authority yeah they they have to because mm-hmm. you can't do anything in the back in the back with uh with elevator unless you had a delta wing and then that kind of that's a whole another set of problems i'm just curious in the back of my mind i'm thinking p factor spiraling st- uh, slipstream how, how is that all affected on that man we're going off top but this is interesting this is interesting i like rabbit holes yeah um you're still gonna have p factor you're still gonna have gyroscopic precession you're still gonna have um, uh, you're not going to have, sorry, you're not going to have prop wash mm-hmm. with the pusher and uh, torque. You're still going to have torque. Now with the multi-engine aircraft, if they set them up, um, counter rotating in kind of a good way, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of those forces kind of cancel each other out. So you don't, you don't get them. But if you're just looking for pure do it on the cheap, everything turns the same way. You only have to have one part line, one product line, one manufacturing, and then you just mount one, mount one on the left, mount one on the right. And that, that creates some other problems uh, as far as multi-engine pilots are concerned um, with critical engines and things like that. But um, Rudder usage? <laughs> a little bit of rudder usage. Uh, rudder usage mainly in the failure mode if one, of them, if one of them has quit and what you need to do there. So, I mean, uh, having a pusher prop? Um, the only thing you're really getting rid of is spiraling slipstream having an effect on the aircraft. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Now, is there, uh, is there anything you can discuss then about, uh, some, like the Honda jet, for example, single engine in the rear. You mean uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the, the vision the, jet, the vision jet. Yeah. yeah. Uh, versus like a multi, a general multi-engine where the, where the engines are on the wing, uh, are on the wings. Um, you know. Or even just the old McDonnell Douglas aircraft or the Boeing 717 where the engines were in the rear versus, you know, say a 737 where the engines are, are more towards the front of the aircraft. Like, so you're talking like DC-10, MD-11, 727? Yeah. Oh, like well, differences mm. between those from a, a effect on the – and I know we're talking about jets now, not yeah, props. But. Um, so where you want to look with like the vision jet is you're going to want to look at your center of thrust. So where the force – that's being created by the squeezing of high high velocity air out the back is acting on the airframe. And you can even look at that on on all the different aircraft uh, from the low wing underslung engines to the the rear mounted, high mounted engine. So with your underslung engines, say on the 737, 767, those types, advancing the throttle also creates a pitch up moment. So if you're mm-hmm. on the edge of stall and you weren't already at uh, you didn't already have 737 the max sure kind of issue at this yeah, point well, it's not necessarily the max but any of them yeah but uh, but, but the pitching the pitch the pitching um if you're already in, was was more intense on the max because yeah. of the larger engines and the fact that they were oh and, and they had and to they compensate had little, yeah they were a little forward as well yep right? they had to move them forward because the engines were mm-hmm. bigger and they had to work with the geometry uh and that so they had to compensate for that yeah and know? that changed the moment of inertia so, so now you have more powerful engines further away from the center of gravity having a bigger effect on the aircraft Mm -hmm. and having a stronger pitching moment. So they had to create a software fix to try and make the aircraft fly just like a normal 737 NG. Uh And Airbus has done this for decades. 
a, a type rating in a 320 is a type rating in a 321, 321. a 318, 318 mm-hmm. 319. It's the same in those because mm-hmm. the the computer makes the aircraft all fly the same. But you have to go through differences training if you're going from one airframe to another. However, uh, that's what that's kind of what Boeing was trying to do. Um, I can't necessarily speak to their methodology or what they were thinking when when they tried to do it, but um, it seems like right now there's issues with oh we're only going to build it with so, such and such component or we're going to offer it with with option levels, and the airlines that were purchasing them were were penny pinching and didn't want to get certain level. Uh, and they didn't want or they didn't pay attention to or their training departments didn't pay attention to the procedures manual for what you need to do with the aircraft and how you need to handle X, Y, Z if if you come across it. Um, now, that's that's a whole chain that led to many, many hundreds of fatalities and a whole lot of scrutiny now from everyone on Boeing uh, and the loss of know billions of dollars but that's not i don't care about the money side of things what i care about is okay why why did we not take the steps necessary to make sure that this thing was 100 percent safe to fly and unfortunately what's coming out of this is a whole bunch of people made made some decisions along the way uh and hid things that made it made it all so much worse Mm -hmm. made it all so much worse um in an effort to get an aircraft out that had uh, had they gone through normal channels and uh, the right oversight happened, would have had, would have been a very different airplane released later than uh, than it was, and we wouldn't be talking about any of this stuff. But anyway, yep. so uh, underslung engines, uh, whereas high mounted rear mounted engines may have a pitch down effect. Uh, a lot of the Russian aircraft from the 1960s and 70s had overmounted uh, jet engines that were, it was high wing aircraft. Uh, I want to say the AN 26, the IL 76. Um, I, I need to study up on my Russian birds. Nope, IL 76 is underslung. Uh, and the IL 26 might not even be a real aircraft. <laughs> No, it's not. Or should I play the Wheel of Fortune theme song? Oh, Wheel of Fortune. Yeah, my <laughs> brother-in-law. He did great. All right. You know, so it's... it's This is all interesting. Might have been Antonov. Huh? Might have been an Antonov. Oh, okay. This is all interesting to me because, uh, you know, I used to be a, a rail fan. And, you know, I used to play train simulators as a kid, et cetera. And one thing you've said in the past, Rob, is just how hard it is to make an accurate airplane simulator right there's like there's one from the 90s or late 80s you said that like simulated stalls correctly but yeah. other than that and it's like you know the rail simulators are a dime a dozen it's just funny I, I i remember early on like you could change things up a little bit by putting the 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 diesel uh 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 locomotive in the front versus in the rear right oh yeah well some tra- weight? you know some chains are push or versus pushing, pull yeah. push versus pull right changes things a little bit but like that's really the only thing you can do with. Tra- I mean, I'm not a train expert, but like you could put you could put the diesel on the front, you put the diesel on the back, like AN seventy two, ch- the Antonov ch- seventy two. Got it, got it. <laughs> I'm glad you found it. But you put put it in the front, put it in the back, changes the physics a little bit with aviation. You know, there's so many different things that you need to learn with regards to physics because you could have prop versus jet, you could have counterclockwise versus clockwise, you could have them rear mounted. You can Even have them under the wing. Count, yeah. yeah. It's just, there's just so much stuff. High bypass, um, low yep. bypass. Yeah. High wing, low wing. I might have mentioned that. Maybe not. Um, but, but, but yeah, just, it's, the, the, it, it's just very fascinating and, and in a way overwhelming. Yeah, and there's no airplane that can really do it all. Um, as we've learned they're recently. They're mission specific. <laughs> as we've know? learned recently. Yeah. <laughs> what do you, you get two out of the three things, pick them. You know, you, you want three things. Pick the two. Can't yeah. get all three. You get yeah. Yeah. And you can have it cheap, fast, and good. Pick any two. Mm-hmm. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so with uh, with your high mounted versus low uh, low mounted or rear mounted, um, yeah, you, there's there's a purpose and a reason to everything and and why they did it back in the day, um, and you see by the evolution of design of what's in place 
what was a good idea, what was a bad idea, what was going to mm-hmm. last, and, and really it's the test of time. So why has the 737 been around forever now? Well, it works. Mm-hmm. It's cheap to operate. It's easily upgradable. It, it fits everywhere. And nowadays... Which, by the way, apparently you can still get a ride on a Dash 200 in Canada, which we'll get to in a second. But that's I want to do very interesting. I want to do that. I want to do that. I was looking it up. You can the seven thirty seven dash two hundred is still flying for a couple airlines. Up in I Canada. think um, is it Suncoast or uh, Swift Air? Somebody who does charters. Yeah, it's not a charter. This is straight up. Like that's very interesting because th- those things are loud, inefficient, yep. high polluting. Mm-hmm. Like there's there's nothing still good flying. about those. Yep. Normally, you'd have to go to, to Africa or someplace. No, you can to, in Canada. Can there's one a day, I think, one flight a day. Woof. Yeah. I got to fly in a Dash 8, which I was actually excited about. Um, Saw that. I was up in Canada. And uh, coming back from London to Toronto was uh, was on a Dash 8. And it was a 20-minute flight. And I, I wish it wasn't 4 o'clock in the morning when we left because I would have liked to get a little more light. on the 20 minute flight. It was a 20 minute flight. What was your cruise? <laughs> I, 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 we were 9,000. Yeah, wow. yeah. We didn't go up high. Um, but I mean, I was, I was assigned to seat 13 a, mm-hmm. and I was one of the first people to get onto the aircraft. And I nodded at the flight attendant up at the front and I started walking towards the back and I'm watching the numbers get bigger and bigger and bigger and realizing I'm running out of numbers <laughs> and I'm doing the math and realizing it's going to end at 12. Yeah. And so I get all the way to the back of this aircraft, and it's row 12. And I'm looking at the FA's seat, and it's got no number on it. Like, there's no way they sat me here. <laughs> and now people are getting on behind me, so yep. I've got to wait because there's no getting around anybody on this thing. Had it's they subbed around. the aircraft, and you didn't know it? or I'd, No clue. Okay. No clue. So at this point, everybody gets on. I walk to the front, and I'm carrying, carrying my helmet bag, and I'm carrying my backpack. Uh, and I go, Hey, uh, I'm in 13 and there's no 13. And he like points over his shoulder and on the front bulkhead, there's a rear facing seat in front of row one. Oh, wow. That's 13. And there's this little old lady sitting in it. And I go, Oh, and he looks at me and he goes, yeah, just go sit 12. There's nobody there. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, okay. Thanks. But yeah, that was, that was my awkward experience there. But then I got to be behind the engine, the cells and watch the mm-hmm. gear and, uh, uh, gear swing and all that. I love, I love watching gear swing. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it is about watching the machine do the thing. Yeah. Uh, the Cessna 172 gear swing is fun because it's like out, back, down, and then finally out and back out. The again Cessna 172, in, in back. the RG, the, the RG. RG. Oh. Yeah. oh, really? And the 182 RG, the 210. I've never seen that before. Yeah. The, the uh, gear swing. Well, you, yeah, you haven't had a reason to even see one of those. Um, but but no, I've, one I've one flown in a Cessna 172 R. What was I? When I was at the high altitude, I think they had a 172R, right? Uh, they had a 172R with a 180 conversion, okay. which is not an RG. The Got RG it. is a 1970, I don't know the first year that they made them, but I think it was like 75 to 85. Okay. It was something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they mainly get used as complex trainers so okay. for people going for a commercial endorsement. Hmm. Um, not endorsement, a commercial certificate and a yep. complex endorsement. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, but no, I love watching the machine work. Mm-hmm. I love watching the things change and articulate and things like that. So it was fun to watch. Uh, it was fun to watch the gear go up. Um, but uh, was there anything funky about it? Now, when we landed, it was snowing real darn hard. The runway was extremely wet and it was brakes, touchdown, full reverse on the props. And we were planted forward, and I was like, this is cool. These guys are flying <laughs> the heck out of this thing. Um, but no, I, I thought it, I, I enjoyed it. Didn't mind it at all. It was a bit loud, as turboprops usually are. Yep. But, uh, Did you have to wear headphones, or wasn't that loud? I had my, I had my, my bows on anyway. Okay. So, uh, I no, normally, if you didn't, would them. you have wanted them? Was yes, it that absolutely. Loud? Okay. <laughs> absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, I liked the aircraft. I thought it was, I thought it was very pleasant. Hmm. Uh, and then we got de-iced with type 4 fluid leaving uh, Toronto coming to Boston as it was snowing uh, quite badly there and it was icing up to I think we were in the clouds up to around 20,000 20, I mean it was mm-hmm. we were in it oh, a wow. while this is coming back to Boston this is coming back to Boston would you fly that on that oh my Embraer 195 uh, oh 175 got it, got it. Yeah. yeah I like those yeah they're cute I don't mind those at yeah. all yeah 
Um, yeah. But yeah, no, it was a good trip up there. It's funny that they have nothing to do with the E-19. I mean, it's a completely different aircraft, but still, I guess it's... Yeah. Made in Brazil. Yep. 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 <laughs> good enough for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, I, th- I thought it was... Uh, I, I like that aircraft. I like the Dash 8. And uh, yeah, the... And was the Dash 8 uh, the aircraft they were flying in um, Buffalo? Uh oh, the fifteen thirty nine. I think that was the last major disaster, right, in the U.S. Um, well, yeah, in the U.S., I believe that that was a Dash Eight. Yes, uh, might have been a Q four hundred, which is the biggest version of the Dash Eight, which is why there were fifty two deaths, I believe, because you had more rows of of seats. Yeah. Um, it was thirty four oh seven. It was thirty four oh seven. It was a dash eight Q four hundred. Yep. Yeah, it was Q four hundred. What's fifteen thirty nine? That was that was cactus. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So the Q four hundred is a longer version of the dash eight, or yep. stretched bigger engines. Gotcha. So the dash eight you were on was that a a series three hundred or a series two hundred? Yeah, I don't remember what it was. It was either a a, a three hundred or a two hundred. Got it. Uh, I think I took a photo of the. I don't know why I did this. I took a photo of the emergency. Uh, what is it? The briefing card? Nah, I didn't. No, nope, mm. I didn't. Mm. Mm, oh wait, wait. Nope, I didn't. <laughs> so tell us the reason why you were going to Canada. You told us about why you're back, but yeah, uh, why did you go to Canada in the first place? How'd well, you get there? How'd I get there? <laughs> I was ferrying uh, an extra three hundred that was going up for some maintenance. It was having um some of the composites uh, repaired and some new paint uh, put on that was a, a freshen up. The aircraft was uh, a 2000, so it was 20 years old, and it had 20 years of, of aerobatic competition and students learning and things mm-hmm. like that. So uh, the owner decided that they wanted a freshen up of that and called around, and the best shop that everybody recommended was this XU Aviation up in London, Ontario. And this is also the same place that did uh, Pete McLeod's Red Bull Air Race plane and the paint job on it. So if there's somebody that's familiar with composites, I mean, these these folks are it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was really interesting to, to kind of hear the owner talk about the process of finding them and then to go up there and drop it off. They had a shop full of diamonds because at London Airport, in Ontario is also the diamond factory. So they're making BA 20 C ones. They're making, uh, the forties, 42s and 62s up there. And, uh, so any kind of repairs that the flight schools in that area need, you know, these guys, are, these guys are on it. Um, so when I go back, what I'm hoping to do is set up some appointments to go tour the diamond factory mm-hmm. and, and see some of that manufacturing process. And also hopefully, Hopefully sit down with Pete McLeod. That would be pretty neat, too, to talk to some uh, Red Bull guys. Now former Red Bull guys, but uh, uh, aerobatic brethren kind of thing. What's up? So when you said London, Ontario, I was like, you know what? This is where that movie... Um, this is where that movie was filmed, The Terminal. But no, it was actually filmed in Montreal. No. I was filming Tom Hanks? The, yep. Never saw it. Montreal Mirable International Airport, which I don't think exists anymore. Ooh. Anyway, uh, I, I don't want to divert attention, but... Um, no, the story's over. <laughs> all right, well, cool. <laughs> That's all I had to really yeah. talk about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This movie was a good movie. It was most exterior shots and those featuring actual aircraft were shot at the Montreal Mirable International Airport, um, which... It's a former international passenger airport. is now a cargo airport only. Oh. Yep. YMX is yep. the identifier. Yep. Cool. Um, but, yeah, going up to Canada. So the last time that I flew to Canada was, I think, 2014 or 2015 with one of my students um, who his, his wife's grandfather had come over from Norway and they settled in Perry Sound, Canada, which mm-hmm. I think is, I don't, I don't, it's, it's about an hour North of Toronto by air by okay. 172. Okay. So he built this cabin out on this lake in Perry Sound. Um, and so he and his wife 
go there every summer and they spend weekends or weeks or whatever they want while they're up there and amphibian aircraft or? no oh. so but the way they've done it in the past was they get a flight out of boston go up to toronto rent a car drive three hours or whatever it is up to up to this place and then mm-hmm. get it all ready but perry sound has an airport mm-hmm. it's a, a small one okay uh i think it was 3500 feet by 50 feet wide uh, and so he wanted to do a flight as part of his training as a cross country to go up there and he wanted to take the wife with him and we're like okay yeah great we'll see what that's like this is real world training for what you want to do and so we loaded the bags up we did the weight and bounce we did all the calculations and where were you flying out of lawrence yeah Mm -hmm. we were operating on a lawrence at that time and um while we were going up there knowing that it was going to be a, a learning experience we tried to reassure the passenger in the back and everything that everything's going to be all right and uh, no problems or anything like that. So part of it is you have to uh, get a hold of uh, can pass and let them know who's coming, how many you got, what time you're going to be there, where you're going to land. Yeah, this is all before you uh, enter the country. And ideally they want it like an hour before um, or at least an hour before. Um, but if you give them 24 to 48 hours, they're not going to complain. Yep. Kind of thing. Yep. Yep. Okay. So we cleared customs just across, uh, from Buffalo and I can't remember the name of the airport there. So, so how does, how does, how does that work? Like, like back up a little bit. Oh, so, yeah. so VFR from here to Buffalo, no issue. I mean, it's a longer flight, no issue. What is the difference between that and going 10 or 15 or 20 miles further? Like what, what changes? Well, the rules of the country, I mean, it's the, it's the international law. You're basically an illegal immigrant if you enter Canada. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but but what, what are the steps? Like, I, let's say that you and I were to wake up tomorrow and we want to fly to Canada. What do we have to do? Find an airplane. Okay. Uh, airplane? Call Can Check. Pass. You have a passport? Do? Yeah. Okay. They, they'd like to have, uh, they like to have that. But literally, to get into Canada, mm-hmm. it's a phone call. Really? Call Can Pass's number. I can look it up real, real quick. It's a 1-800 number. And, and so you're, let's say you're talking to, to, you're talking to Buffalo, you know, you're on AT, will they just hand you off to Canada? Do you have to give them a special code or anything like that? Or no. they'll just hand you off to Canada? Yeah, they'll just hand you off to Canada. And, and, but what validates that you're not going to have fighter jets on your wing in five, you know, in five minutes? The that fact it's that you, Canada. <laughs> that you, that you had flight following. Okay. Okay. So yeah. The so you definitely pass- need flight following to go VFR into Canada from the US. Or you, yeah. Okay. Well, you could be on a flight plan, but. They want to know who you are. They want to know who's crossing their border. Um, so, so, so be on flight so, following. So, so ATC in the U.S. will hand you off to ATC in Canada. Yeah. And you know, normally VFR, we would say, you know, this is November one, two, three, four, five. Uh, VFR X thousand feet. Um, That's it. Stop talking. Let go of the button. Right. That's it. That's it. You don't have to give them any sort of number. No. Or, so it's more it's more difficult to land at a private airstrip in the U.S. than it is. To, to cross into Canada. Yeah, it's about the same process, actually. Yeah. You're going to make a phone call. Yep. You're going to get permission, which is basically let them know when you're going to be there, and then go. And so do they tell you where to land or at that point to clear customs, or you pick the? You just have to go to an airport that... You need to go to an airport of entry, yep. but you pick that. You know? Okay, and they're tracking you to make sure you're landing at an airport entry. If you're gonna... And even then, uh, when I went in 2010... Thunderstorms popped up over top of the airport that I was that I had told Can Pass that I was going to. I was going to uh, mm-hmm. uh, London mm-hmm. actually, yeah. and the thunderstorms were over London. I ended up diverting however many miles to the east to Kitchener, which did or did not have customs. Which did. Okay. It was an airport of entry, and I landed there. Called Can Pass before I got out of the airplane, and they said, "You have anything to declare? No. Any changes to what you called us for earlier? No." All right, welcome to Canada. Have a nice day. Thanks. Click. Okay. So the process, like you asked, going to Canada tomorrow, we'll call them tonight and yep. say, hey, yeah, we're going to get there at this time. We're in this aircraft. Here's, it's this dude. It's me. It's Matt. It's Rob. Yep. And they go, okay, we'll see you when you get there. So I'm conf- I'm still a little confused. So if I was at Niagara Falls right now crossing, they're sure. going to, they're going to check my passport. They're going to ask me, ask me questions. Like yes, it's it's a more it's an easier process than say going from here to Europe, but they're still going to ask me questions. They're still interrogates the wrong word, but they're going to talk to me. They're going to investigate. Yeah. You're you're saying that like going into Canada, it's like a handshake if you're going in by air, by airplane. I have yet 
to have a Canadian customs officer meet me at the airplane in Canada. So you, you so have done this sh- three times. So you didn't have to show your passport to anybody this past trip? No. Not until I was getting, um, till I was clearing customs in Toronto, U.S. customs in right. Toronto to come back to the United States. Nobody saw my passport. I had to give the number from it to CanPass when yeah. I was talking to him on the phone. But other than that, nobody saw it. So do you think that if you hadn't called CanPass, if you just, you were talking a flight following, you know, up in New York, northern New York, and you just crossed into Canada and you, you started talking ATC in Canada, no can pass, no pre pre approval, nothing. Do you think anybody would have said anything? Yep. Okay. Definitely would have been in trouble. All right. Um, so they know they're they're watching your tail number. They're they're watching something as you cross that border. Yeah. Got yeah. It. yeah. So when, when I landed in um, Niagara Executive, mm-hmm. just just outside the border, and uh, called for flight following while I was still on the ground, and they said, "Hey, where are you going?" I go, "I'm going up to London, Ontario." And they said, "Okay, well." It's going to take me a minute to get you a code. And so it took them a little a little bit longer than I, I've seen in the past to get the code because uh, I, I assume there was something with it going international. So Got he it. had to not yeah. only clear it with, um, the FAA with Niagara, the, yeah. not Niagara, Buffalo approach, but he also then had to talk to Toronto. And I got the handoff to Toronto because they are so, so close mm-hmm. within about three minutes. Mm. So it wasn't very long. And there's a restricted area. There's a restricted area around the falls. Mm-hmm. And so I had to go around that. It's a small restricted area. Um, but I, th- I can't remember what the altitude's on it off the top of my head, but it's up to like 4,500 feet or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, it might have been 4,900. But it's only about two or three miles. And I think I put the shot up on, on Instagram yep. that I took out the, the, excuse me, that I took out the window. That's great on a pod. Oh, and you're yawning. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Good story, bro. <laughs> but it's I, all right. I, I went around. They couldn't see I'm yawning. Oh, wait. Never mind. Yeah. They can. <laughs> I, I went around that airspace. And uh, yep. uh, when I landed at London, uh, as I was taxiing off the runway, they asked where I wanted to go. And I said, I want to go to XU. I said, well, have, do you need to call anybody for customs? And I said, or the, you need to see anyone for customs. And I said, yeah, I suppose I do. And they said, okay, go over to the FBO over there. So I pull up to the FBO, and I, sh- I shut the aircraft down, waiting for somebody to come out, and nobody came out. And I didn't wait very long. It was like two minutes. But then I called CanPass and got them on the phone. you got to listen to the menu because they say everything in English, then French. Uh, I believe you just have to press two. So <laughs> skip. Um, finally got on with, with somebody and had the conversation. Hmm? Hey, where are you? You have anything to declare? Welcome to Canada. Sweet. Cool. Fired back up. Taxied over to XU. Wasn't a big deal. Now, for the 20 minutes that you were in Canada, because there's, there's fees over there for ATC, right? No. I thought in Canada they have they charge a certain amount. For, sure. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, I believe you're the you are one correct. That, you're the one that has <laughs> yeah. told me that before. I believe you are Those correct. Those words came yeah. out of your mouth. Yes. There there are usage fees there, user fees there. Yep. Um, they're going to build the tail number. Yep. Got it. Got so it. I won't see any of that. Makes sense. So what else, Rob? Um, uh, dang it! What were we talking about? I already forgot. Uh, no, no, we here. were moving on to the next topic. We talked about Canada. We talked about. Oh no! So yeah. we didn't. Really, we kept getting sidetracked by questions. Yep. Okay. It's call can pass ahead of time. Oh yeah. Let them know you're coming. <clears throat> uh oh, our my story with Perry Sound. Okay, I was still doing that. So we landed uh just in the oh, uh, just right. across the border. Yeah. Called Can Pass before we got out of the airplane. They said, welcome to Canada. Yep. Thanks, guys. Get out, and we need gas. Oh. Because we've got three people and bags in a Cessna 172. We could only take about 30 gallons. Yep. That's not enough to get up to Perry Sound from Lawrence. Now, what system does Canada use for measurement? Metric system. Metric system. So we've got to do the gallons oh, no. to liters. You know, this was a... This was an issue. Yes, this, it was. This was a uh, this caused a serious disaster. Um, the, I think the if you're talking about the Gimli glider, no, oh, the glider, they actually they most made people it survive. Yeah, yeah, they were fine. Yeah. But it's happened. Yeah. It has happened. Maybe not on massive major scales, but it has happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in, in the POH for the Cessna 172, there's a conversion table, there's a conversion chart. So we looked at how many gallons we needed. Wouldn't it just be easier leaders. if the U.S. switched to the metric system? 
No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't mind Celsius. I All like right. Celsius. Me I too. think Celsius is good. Hi, Beaumont. Makes sense. You want to come up here? Yeah. I could go. So anyway, we got gas. We take off. We're on our way to Perry Sound. Mm hmm. And Canada gets rather rural. And then it gets even worse. So in the areas that we're flying between Buffalo, New York, and Perry Sound, it is lakes, 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 100-foot tall pine trees. Okay. Okay. Tightly spaced enough uh -huh. that there's no place to land this thing. Okay. You, you lose a motor. You know, my favorite game, where are you going to go? Yeah, where are you going to go? You lose a motor. You have very few options. You're basically going to put it in the water right next to shore. That's going to be your best spot. Mm -hmm. And as we're flying along, I'm seeing this. Belmont, no, no, go. Going to move the whole camera. Mm -hmm. Good boy. All right, come here. You're okay. All right, so we're flying over nothing but trees and water. And I reach over and I flip the intercom up to crew. Mm -hmm. So it's just he and I yep. talking to each other. And I go, John, where are you going to go? He looks over and he doesn't, he doesn't see anything. He's like, there's nowhere to go, man. Yeah, that's right. So let's continue with your training in the Cessna, but I want you to move over to the Cirrus program. And I want you to go fly an airplane with a parachute. Because yeah. this is the entire reason, this flight that we're doing right now is the entire reason that you're learning to fly. And so the safest possible aircraft for you to be in with your family is an SR-22. You went, all right. So that's a student that I've lost, but I've, I'll take that any day of the week. And we sent him over to the Sierra side and he finished up his, his, his uh, private and his instrument there. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a partner in an SR-22 turbo. Oh, cool. Uh, and he actually petitioned the Canadian government for him and his wife to be able to enter the country of Canada at Perry Sound. <laughs> They're the only two people in the, in the world who can clear custom, Canadian custom, at Perry Sound. Wow. Yeah. So he takes he loads up the aircraft at the end of the workday, and it's one hop into 22. Yep. Up to there. Yep. And they call Camp Paz, go, we're here. And they go, cool, bonjour, welcome, you know. That's awesome. Have a good day. Mm -hmm. You know? So uh, really neat kind of utility that he was able to get and able to work out. And then coming back to the U.S., their nexus, uh, I don't know mm -hmm. what that necessarily entails them above and beyond. Yep. But uh, similar to global entry. Yeah. But, yeah it's... So, I mean, it's it's awesome, uh, awesome ways that they've used what they wanted to do in the aircraft and everything to accomplish this mission and, and to, to do it their own way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's that was – that was only my second time going to Canada. And then this was my third time flying in, uh, flying into there. Now coming back, when I pick the airplane back up in two weeks, I'll have to clear U.S. Customs mm -hmm. um, somewhere here at an airport of entry. And that that is a much more involved process. Handsome. I probably won't. No. I probably won't. Um, so you have to get onto EAPIS and create a manifest. So you put all your information in, the aircraft information, your passport, uh, and then you have to submit that uh, 24 to 48 hours. I'm sorry, 12 to 48 hours in advance of your crossing. Now, is crossing the, the definition of leaving the country or is landing in the other country? For example, they literally you... have time of crossing the border. They want an estimated time of crossing the border in there. Got it. So if you're, let's say you're, you're, you're just flying and you cross into Canada, circle Niagara Falls from the Canadian side, then come back across without landing. Have you done a crossing or is it so there you're in Canadian airspace, but you're not actually landing in the country? Um, there is an entire advisory circular or procedure, something, something, something for overflight of the falls. Um, I did that, I think, in 2012 or 2013, mm -hmm. specifically coming out of Kent. Mm -hmm. That was probably 2012. And uh, I don't know if we ever got a user fee from that, um, mainly because I wouldn't ever see that. Mm -hmm. um, I might have been talked to by Sheila. Like, hey, did you do this? Yeah, I did. That might have happened. I don't know. 
she's asked me that question a lot, so I don't really, <laughs> I don't know. But I know that at other times I've specifically um, said unable to ATC when I was going to Michigan, and they wanted to take me through Canadian airspace mm-hmm. uh, over Lake Erie up through Detroit, and I said unable because the the, the university did not want to pay the user fees, yeah. and I had to take the long way around. So I guess that makes sense. If you're not, if you're just crossing through and you're not landing, it's probably not considered uh, an exit and reentry. So when when we went to Oshkosh uh, two years ago, and it was Rylan and I, and Hillary was in the back seat, and we were in the, the Arrow, we went from uh, I think Greensboro, New York, to somewhere in Michigan, and we we took the over Canada route to get there. Uh, I believe the aircraft did get hit with a user fee again it went to the owners Mm -hmm. it went to the company it didn't come to me um but we didn't have to clear customs because we never touched down yeah and i know in maritime law you can sail into canadian waters as long as you don't touch land it's no big deal and come back to the u.s and got it it's it's nothing uh and a lot of a lot of aviation um is is borrowed from maritime anyway so it wouldn't surprise me if those were all all very similar cool makes sense did I finish my story? I don't even know. I think you did. <laughs> well, you talked about you were talking about oh coming, coming back, back so to the U.S. Where where are you going to clear customs? Uh, probably Niagara again. Okay, just so, get it over with. Yeah, yeah. and um, it, in there, so you have to file the APIS. You have to call and schedule uh, an appointment to make sure that an inspector is going to be there, and the inspectors are going to come down from the 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 bridge over to Niagara, and it takes them like twenty minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, so you need to make sure that you have an appointment that somebody's going to be there to inspect the aircraft. And every time that I've done that coming back into the U.S., I have met uh, a, a member of, uh, uh, oh, my goodness, CBP, Customs and Border Protection. Um, they have gone around the aircraft with a Geiger counter. They have interviewed me. What were you doing in Canada? How long were you there? They've, they've done their due diligence. Uh, and one time, one time I came back and we didn't have an appointment. Luckily the guy was there. Um, but he took me aside and he did it in an interesting way. So he was interviewing everybody that was, that was on the plane. <laughs> Just for you. I'm going to get going. comments on that. At least you have socks on this time. Yep, yep. Uh, he was interviewing everybody in the plane and when he was satisfied, he looked at the two other people and he said, you guys need to use a restroom? And they went, no, we're fine. And he goes, I think you need to go use the restroom while I talk to this young man here. Mm. And I went, oh, <laughs> that's what's happened. Mm-hmm. And uh, he pulled me aside and he goes, look, if I hadn't been here, do you know what the fine is? No. And he goes, it's $20,000 just for me to show up. Do you have $20,000? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And he goes, get out of here. So if you're doing that border crossing, yep. if you're doing that border crossing, make sure you call, have that appointment, fill out yep. the APIS. Well, I just did the APIS. I didn't realize that, that you, you had to also have this appointment. Well, speaking of appointments, yeah. can I tangent? Yeah, yeah, I'm done. So my, my pre-check expires this year, and oh. I decided to get global entry. Nice. And um, so I you have uh, to do an appointment. I, yeah. Well, no, no. Hold on. Yeah. So I applied for Global Entry Online, and uh, you know, it's like okay, just make an appointment. So I started searching Boston, and I started searching all the surrounding areas, New Hampshire, et cetera. There were no appointments in the next six months anywhere, none whatsoever. I started doing a little googling, and they're like, oh yeah, like everybody's behind right now, and like you have to wait six months. Your best bet is to just like show up and wait, and maybe they'll sneak you in. And I said something's really weird. So I was flying to New York last week on JetBlue and, and I just, instead of going into Newark, I went into JFK yeah. and I decided, okay, well, let me check JFK. Wide open schedule. Literally what? every half an hour they had an appointment and and I said, this reminds me of that movie. Do you have an appointment? <laughs> nope. Don't know that movie. Really? Yeah. Which it's, one's that it's, one? It's, uh, it's, uh, I think it's from Terminal, actually. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah dude, <laughs> really? You have to watch it. It's so good. So, I'm there, and while I'm there, um, I'm in the waiting room and whatever, and guy calls me back. But people kept saying, does anybody in the room have a New York State ID? And I was assuming 
that they were asking that because maybe they were giving those people priority because it is a New York global uh, yeah. entry app, customs, whatever. So I go, I get approved, I get my global entry card in the mail already, and I, I then catch a flight to Chicago and, and you know, everything's good. But I was doing a little bit of reading today and an, an article popped up and apparently in early February, the state of New York stopped allowing the U.S. government to request background information on its, um, on its uh, citizens, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so therefore... Anybody in New York is currently banned from applying for pre-check or global entry. And that's why there was and no that's line. Why there's no li- that's why there's no wait. So if you are trying to renew your pre-check or global entry and you don't want to wait six months, go to JFK. You'll, you'll have a same-day appointment. Same day. What is wrong with... Oh, same day. goodness. Yep. Um, okay. That was my story. Wow. Yep. So you already have it. I got it. Yeah. My interview was five minutes. It was great. If I did more international traveling, I think that would be a good Yeah, it took two seconds. To yep. I wonder if that how how much different was that from your uh, TSA pre check? Pre check seventy five, I think, and this was ninety nine, but I mean my my credit card reimburses me for it. So. Well, I mean like uh the interview process. Because oh. we both did the TSA pre check. Oh, but super easy. I, I sat to I mean it was a little bit you're sitting down this time with like an actual customs official, whereas with the pre check it's it's just with a TSA agent. Mm. Um not to say one is better than the other or anything like that, but it's it's a little bit more – seems more involved. There's an illusion of it being more involved with global entry. But the guy – he brought me back a room, asked me a couple questions. We talked about the gap between my teeth and my braces. Which is like, looking hey, better. Thank right? you. It's yeah. getting getting smaller and getting smaller. Um, and uh, and that was it. Uh, I, I threw in there that I had, you know, I had done some flying lessons and stuff. You know, like he just talked about – we were talking about flying and whatever. So it worked. It worked out fine. Cool. And throw any Aloha snack bars in there or anything. What? <laughs> That's for me. What? <laughs> so anyway, New York has appointments available every half an hour for the foreseeable future. Wow. Yep. Wow. That that blows my mind. All right, aviation questions. Do you have any? Yeah, we got two. Oh, so the first got? one is actually for me. The second one is actually not my question, but it's something I've been meaning to ask you. Okay, we have ten minutes. Um so the 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 first question uh, relates to what we were discussing earlier. So if you, and I think this will help me understand stability and also some of our listeners that are maybe early on in their private pilot training. If you were to make one change to the 172 costs aside to make it less stable, what would you do? To make it le- less F- stable. Uh, zero cost, FCG. All right. Well, what about more of a structural change? A structural change to make it less stable. Mm-hmm. Um, what would make it? What would make it more? What would make I mean, it less stable? Like re- lowering the wings. Uh, what's uh, our desired outcome here? Like, why are we making it less stable? Making it more aerobatic. Eh, I wouldn't want to do that to. A I know you wouldn't want to do that to one seventy two. But this is all. Sometimes on the spread okay. aviation podcast, probably, we make believe. Probably what I would do is just take out the dihedral in the wing. Uh, that would be the, that would be the first thing. Okay. It's got a little bit of dihedral. I would take all that out. I wouldn't even, uh. Now would that affect the spin characteristics of the aircraft? Mm. Or would it just make it more that you, you, you're, you're all trimmed and your hands off and you push the yoke. It's not going to necessarily return back to where you were. That's very interesting question. Um, would it affect the spin? characteristic it may it may introduce some oscillatory modes that we haven't seen from it it may help the uh the spin characteristics it may hurt it i'm not 100 percent sure what it would do to spin um this is something that we have to kind of i'm fire, not, not fire up fire yeah. up plane and, and modify it we'll have to Feel free. There yeah. it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. What's your other question? So my other question is, we'll have to give Peter a call and okay. ask him to, to kind of make a 172 and explain without the, the dihedral and see what happens. Yeah. All right. Second question. And this is something that we're going to have to talk about way more on future episodes of the, of the podcast. But and it's something where your knowledge and my knowledge overlap. And it'll be very interesting because this is happening in medicine a little bit. Mm. What do you think is the future of machine learning and artificial intelligence 
in aviation, particularly piloting aircraft? Uh, wow, that's a pretty good question. What is the future of automation? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily technology? automation, but but machine learning, and there's a difference, right? Machine so so learning. so automation, you can program you can program automation to like be rule based, right? So you can say if this do that, if this do that. True machine learning is almost to the point where you don't always know why the system is making a decision that it's making. It just makes it and it does it based on previous input and you, things that it has learned. You know past. what I hear a lot mm -hmm. uh, on a radio? What? Hey, uh, it's kind of bumpy right here. Are there any reports uh, from other aircraft at other altitudes where it's smooth? I would venture that part of the machine learning and the algorithms are going to be kind of Google Maps and Waze on crack. So as the aircraft get this this data link, this talking to each other capability that mm -hmm. ADSB is kind of the start of, and, and MODES transponders and things like that, is you're going to start to see the aircraft giving ride reports to other aircraft and to ATC and saying, "Hey, it's garbage here, but that guy, it's fine over there." And you're going to start to see uh, even more a connection between. It, it won't even be PI reps. It'll be like air reps. It'll be the aircraft giving the report to ATC and to the other pilots uh, as to what the conditions are, what's going on, and, and allowing uh, dispatchers and flight planners and, it, and air traffic control to reroute aircraft and put them at other places and in other locations to capitalize mm -hmm. on uh, on winds, on weather, on smooth ride, whatever. So you know, last episode, we talked about the, the record-setting uh, aircraft crossing the Atlantic. Well, if you know aircraft A and aircraft B were in two different locations and they optimize the routes and put mm -hmm. C, you know, in in a better spot, then that's gonna that's gonna unkink the chain back behind them and and help everybody out. So I think machine learning is gonna look at the routes. It's gonna look at the weather. It's gonna look at the reports from the aircraft, and it's gonna take that data and process it faster than a human can, can process more data faster than a human mm -hmm. can to improve flow through the, the national aerospace system. And a lot of that will have to be around decision-making as well. So we'll have the data and it'll be able to make decisions based on the data it has yeah, compared, like suggested to, route. compared to previous data, previous decisions that it would have made in the past or things that it has learned in the past. Yeah. Um, like ways going, we found a faster route. Right. It takes five minutes. Mo right. Most... We've offered it to 3407, but he turned it down. Do you, do you want it over here on 802? Yeah. M most aircraft, uh, especially like V1, V2, go, no go, right? Like that's a, that's a, that's a conscious decision the pilots are making. And if, and it's, I don't know of any aircraft right now that would auto abort a takeoff roll in the event of a failure, right? Or are, or do they exist? Uh, I think the systems exist on some Airbuses where they have an auto takeoff. Um, again, that's me reaching for the memory of an article that I yeah. glanced over many years ago. Um, but I, let's, ugh, let's, I don't think they're going to take the pilot out of that yeah. because like your, your, your story, a couple episodes ago of your buddy who, uh, they had a failure. I think it was you. There was some kind of failure below V1 mm -hmm. and he didn't do the cut and it, it turned out. Was that you? Was it, me? It, okay. Yeah. There was somebody that there was. There was. It was right on the borderline. Are you talking decided, to other people behind my? Of course back? I am. <laughs> and they decided to take it flying. No, 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 no. It was an above V one. Okay. I'm pretty sure it was your buddy. They had a. They had an issue above V one, and they decided to cut anyway, and they hammered the brakes, and they got it stopped, and the the issue turned out that it would not have been a flyable aircraft period if they'd have gotten it off the ground it would not have gone and it was just it was his spidey sense or it's something it's not my story okay it's, but but that's somebody. that's actually really interesting it's so, extremely so they, rare and so, again so here's the question protocol. did they get fired uh, did they get in trouble i did not hear any kind of negative reaction to that. again it's me reaching for a story i barely yeah. recall and uh, to pull a line from Top Gear on that bombshell, it's time to end the Spread Aviation podcast. Yeah, let's let's episode thirty. Yeah, let, let, let's keep this question at a high level, but I'd love to dive into it more with you in the future because I think yeah. automation, especially with the overlap in our knowledge, this will be this will be, be interesting. It'll be fun about. to watch things watch things roll out. If you have any predictions for the future of automation or uh, in aviation or any other questions for us here at Spread Aviation Podcast, 
send us an email. Hello at spreadaviation.com. We're also available on iTunes, uh, which is now uh, Apple Podcasts. So we're available on Apple Podcasts. Uh, we're available on Spotify, Google Play, our website, as well as YouTube. For the, for the most recent episodes. And the Monday Night Live streams, twitch.tv slash spread aviation. Anything else? I don't think so. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, everybody. Fly safe. safe. Nice. You did that. Same time. Hi, and welcome to the Plane Talk Spread Aviation. I just made the same mistake as Rob. All the time. Yeah, no. All the time. <laughs> yeah.